Hall of Fame voting is stupid. However, one of my deepest character flaws is that I care about it, which makes me stupid. And here it is, your 2023 Baseball Hall of Fame ballot. There are hundreds of baseball writers receiving their ballots in the mail. They have a chance to vote for up to 10 players, and if 75% of them vote for the same player, they will be inducted into the Hall of Fame next year. If you don't want to watch this full video, here's like a 30 second summary of what's going on. Bonds, Clemens, and Schilling are gone. They had their 10th and final year on the ballot last year, but their candidacy is still very much alive. We'll be talking about them later. With those three vacated, this is a chance for some of those sabermetric darlings to really make huge gains in the voting this year and maybe even get in. The girl boss himself, Alex Rodriguez, returns for his second year on the ballot. He, of course, represents the last big, big name, the last vestige of the steroid era. And Carlos Beltran highlights the list of newcomers to the ballot. He, of course, will represent an interesting case study for the 2017 Houston Astros. In fact, let's hop on board with Carlos Beltran here because statistically, Carlos Beltran is a Hall of Famer. For me, there's no debate over that. If you're a counting stats person, maybe more traditional, he has 400 home runs and 2,700 hits from the center field position. If you're a more sabermetrically inclined person, he has 70 war, which is, I think once you get to 70, that's when you start to enter sort of like no doubter type territory. So Carlos Beltran, Hall of Fame career statistically. His numbers are extremely, and I mean extremely similar to those of another Hall of Famer. This is him versus Andre Dawson. You can tell, you know, with the hits, the home runs, the OPS+. Plus, very, very similar players. Beltran does have him beat in one spot, though, and that's the fact that Carlos Beltran is an elite base stealer. He's one of the most elite, efficient base stealers the game has ever seen. In fact, here's every player in MLB history with at least 300 stolen base attempts. By success rate, Carlos Beltran is first among that group. He was successful in 86.4% of his opportunities. That's ahead of Tim Raines. It's ahead of Gerard Dyson. To better contextualize Beltran, we're going to turn to Jaws here for a second. Jaws is a combination of their career wins above replacement, but also their peak. And I know the peak is important for a lot of people. So we're talking about longevity here, but we're also talking about peak. Anyways, by Jaws, Carlos Beltran is ninth all-time among center fielders. Everyone ahead of him is either in the Hall of Fame or Mike Trout, who's going to be in the Hall of Fame. So yes, this is arguably a top 10 center fielder of all time should be going into the Hall of Fame. However, this is a unique candidacy because in the final year of Carlos Beltran's career, he was on the 2017 Houston Astros. They won the World Series, and then a few years after that, we found out they were using an electronic sign-stealing system. And Beltran was villainized because of this. The Ken Rosenthal and Evan Drellick article that broke the story in 2019 spoke of a veteran player who is at the forefront of pushing this sign-stealing system, and most people believe that they were talking about Carlos Beltran in this case. One immediate consequence was that Carlos Beltran lost a managerial job. He had been hired by the Mets at the conclusion of the 2019 season to manage their team, and in January they parted ways. I think it helps to keep in mind that Hall of Fame candidacies aren't a sprint, they're really more of a marathon. Carlos Beltran's going to be on this ballot for up to 10 years. That's a long time to have to hold a grudge about something that happened in 2017. You see that sentiment with other 2017 Astros. You know, they aren't as vilified now as they were initially when the story dropped. Maybe them winning the World Series last year helps it a little bit, but the point is... It's hard to stay angry for that long. I expect Carlos Beltran to do very well on this round of balloting. It also helps to remember that Carlos Beltran was a player for the 2017 Houston Astros. I know he was viewed and brought in as a veteran leader, but he was not a coach. He was not Alex Cora. He was not A.J. Hinch. He was not Jeff Lunau. You know, ultimately, he's a man and he's responsible for his own decision, but there were people above him who had the potential to stop this thing and didn't. The next bucket of players I want to talk about are what I would call the trendy sabermetric guys. These are the guys who over the years have gotten a lot of love from people, particularly in the more sabermetric circles, and they're starting to see some serious progress over the years in terms of their candidacy. So here's Scott Rowland. In 2020, he got 35% of the vote. 2021, 53. Last year, 63. And now he's going into year six in a really good position. Todd Helton, same thing, just making gains. Billy Wagner, 
Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones up to 41%. This will be his sixth year on the ballot. Billy Wagner up to 51%. This will be his eighth year on the ballot. And Helton up to 52% last year. This will be his fifth year on the ballot. We're back here looking at Jaws, and you can see everyone above him is either in the Hall of Fame, with the exception of Adrian Beltre, who is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. So that's Scott Rowland. Third base is a position that has often been overlooked in Hall of Fame balloting. There have been a lot of really well-rounded guys who didn't quite get any love, and I think Scott Rowland represents the best of them, and he's on a really good trajectory. He's almost certainly going to get in. In fact, he may even get in this year. Next, I'd like to talk about Todd Helton, who broke that very important 50% barrier, hopefully on his way to 75% in last year, which was just his fourth year on the ballot. Again, with guys like Ortiz, Bonds, Clemens, Schilling off the ballot, there's a lot of space for these sabermetric guys to make huge gains this year. That's going to be the main thing I pay attention to. Couple fun Todd Helton stats. We're looking at 400 total base seasons here. And this is something that hasn't been accomplished since 2001, but 400 total bases in a season. Todd Helton did it twice in a row, 2000 to 2001. The only other players with multiple 400 total base seasons, Babe Ruth, Rogers Hornsby, Jimmy Fox, Sammy Sosa, Chuck Klein, and Lou Gehrig. So pretty elite company there for Todd Helton. Now, you might correctly point out that he played his career during the steroid era in Coors Field. So, how about like a park and ear adjusted stat? Here are all the players in MLB history with at least 9,000 plate appearances and 130 OPS plus that aren't in the Hall of Fame. Barry Bonds, steroids. Main Ramirez, steroids. Albert Pujols, he's going to get there. Miggy, he's going to get there. A-Ron, steroids. Gary Sheffield, steroids. Rafael Palmero, steroids. Fred McGriff, we're going to talk about him later, but really, Todd Helton, if you just look at him and look at what he's accomplished, everyone who's not in the Hall of Fame that has at least a 130 OPS plus and that many career plate appearances has a reason to not be in the Hall of Fame, except for Fred McGriff, who we'll talk about. Billy Wagner's also on the ballot. He's sort of the trendy sabermetric pick for relievers. He threw 900 career innings, and his 900 career innings, I would take over anyone's except with maybe the exception of Mariano Rivera. Uh, this is a good time to shout out the Billy Wagner for Hall of Fame account, which I believe is ran by Jeremy Frank and Jim Passan, my dear, dear friends. Uh, career ERI plus of 141 for Trevor Hoffman. Billy Wagner threw at least 40 innings pitched in 13 different seasons. His lowest ERA plus, his worst of those seasons, was 141. So definitely follow this account. I'm a big supporter of Billy Wagner, and I think, you know, the time is running out for him. This is going to be his eighth year on the ballot. Last year he did break 50%, but it's going to be it's going to be tight at the end for him, I think. And then the final of the trendy sabermetric picks is Andrew Jones, and I feel like a broken record when I say this, but if I told you, just in a vacuum, that the greatest defensive center fielder of all time also had 434 career home runs, wouldn't you think that's a Hall of Famer? If someone who's the best at a premium defensive position also hit 400 home runs, wouldn't you think that's a Hall of Famer? Wouldn't you think that's maybe the one of the greatest baseball players of all time? That's Andrew Jones right now. He's lagging a little behind. He and Wagner. I think Helton and Roland are in really good spots overall. I think Jones is hurt by a couple things. Uh, one is his steep fall off after age 29. I think he sort of gave the impression that he just, you know, didn't care. He got fat. He didn't care. Um, and that's not great if you're trying to celebrate competitiveness, right? And the other thing, too, you know, is that he was uh, arrested for domestic violence um, during his playing career. And, you know, if you're going to enforce the character clause and be very strict about it, then maybe Andrew Jones is someone you leave off your ballot for that reason. So once again, here's their balloting history, and I would just say that Roland and Helton are in really, really good spots. You know, with 63% last year heading into year six, that's a great spot to be for Roland. He will almost certainly be a Hall of Famer. Same for Todd Helton, breaking that 50% barrier heading into year five. That's great. It's the guys like Wagner and Jones who I find a little bit more concerning. You know, Wagner just breaking that 50% barrier, now heading into year eight. He's running out of time. And, you know, Jones, he's at 41%, and yet, you know, he's at the same point going into year six as Roland is, and Roland's over 20% ahead of him. So Wagner and Jones are maybe the two more important of this group. I think Roland and Helton, they're on a really good trajectory. I think they'll almost certainly be Hall of Famers just 
it'll be tough to say if it'll be this year or not, you know. Big opportunities for all those guys to make gains because Ortiz, Schilling, Bonds, Clemens, they're all gone. And it used to be, you know, Andrew Jones and Wagner and Helton and Scott Rowland. They were sort of the underdogs on the ballot. Now they highlight the ballot. Now they're the front runners. So really interesting candidacies all around. I would like to take a moment to talk about the steroid guys. And I know there's been a lot of Bonds and Clemens hubbub over the years, but there are still steroid guys on the ballot. These are the four players on the ballot who I believe and who the media, you know, the voters believe, are confirmed steroid users. Andy Pettit, Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, and Gary Sheffield. Now, you could sort these four into the same bucket, but I actually believe there's a lot of nuance when it comes to these players and their relationships with steroids and performance-enhancing drugs and just the concept of cheating in general. Gary Sheffield, for example, you know, was wrapped up in the Balco thing, was named in the Mitchell report, but, you know, he was caught at a time when, you know, testing against PED usage wasn't a thing the league was doing regularly. They hadn't really come to terms with the steroid issue. That was something that was still being sort of swept under the rug. And, you know, as such, you can have in my opinion, a little bit more sympathy for some of these guys like Gary Sheffield. You can also have sympathy for Andy Pettit. This is someone who, you know, used HGH, uh, in his words, for injury recovery and then was honest about it. You know, I would say Andy Pettit was maybe the first key player, big name I can remember coming out and being like, hey, I did this, it was wrong, and I'm sorry. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have guys like Manny Ramirez and Alex Rodriguez. These guys were caught when they should have known better, when the consequences were clear, you know, when the steroid era had already been litigated and all those sluggers had testified in front of Congress. Like, if you get caught after all that happens, after all that fallout, I think that there should be less sympathy for you. You know, Mayor Ramirez effectively had to retire for Major League Baseball because he kept getting caught cheating. You know, uh, Alex Rodriguez, you know, caught multiple times. So, you know, these guys, I think, are in a slightly different category than guys like Pettit and Sheffield. Now, given that this is indeed a ballot breakdown, a ballot analysis, the only one of these four players with a snowball's chance of reaching the Hall of Fame via the writer's ballot at any point in this process is Alex Rodriguez. That's just based on the results we're seeing over the years. You know, May Ramirez was an amazing player statistically, one of the greatest right-handed hitters of all time. Same could be said for Gary Sheffield, but they have been tainted. Their candidacy is going nowhere if you look at the voting results. Andy Pett is another guy who I think would be a really sneaky dark horse if it wasn't for the steroid usage, but the exception is Alex Rodriguez. He, he may have a chance, and let me tell you why. It's because Alex Rodriguez, with all due respect to the other three, is one of the absolute greatest players in MLB history. In fact, you can make the argument right now, statistically, Alex Rodriguez is the greatest infielder to ever play the game of baseball. That's how potent he was. That's how dangerous he was. That's Alex Rodriguez. This is an inner circle Hall of Famer. This is an arguable top 10 player in MLB history. That's how good he was. And when you have a player like that, you know, it's really hard to tell the story of baseball without mentioning their contributions. This is a player that if you took away 30% of all his production saying, you know, this guy cheated, we're going to take away 30% of his production, he would still be a Hall of Famer. And I don't quite think you can say those things about Pettit or Sheffield or Manny Ramirez. And it also helps that Alex Rodriguez has a very big media career that he's using to revitalize his image for the American public and you know, for baseball writers. David Ortiz got in first ballot after he even had some PED questions on his resume. And a big reason why that happened is because, you know, he's very famous, very popular, very well liked. And that's kind of what Alex Rodriguez is shooting for. He is trying to revitalize his image in a way that Sheffield Ramirez and and Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens either can't or just aren't interested in doing. And you probably don't need to hear it from me, but just to help contextualize A-Rod's greatness, here are the 10 players who had at least 100 wins above replacement since integration. And this is a list of nothing short 
10 of the greatest players to ever play the game. That's that's where A-Rod is. He's fourth on this list, just behind Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, and Barry Bonds. That's the type of company we're talking about. Alex Rodriguez ended up making a fairly modest debut on last year's Hall of Fame ballot, capturing 34% of the vote. And the question is, going forward, you know, are you going to be seeing 5% or 10% year-over-year gains, like we've seen with some of the sabermetric darlings, or will his candidacy just kind of stagnate? There's a really interesting example on this ballot of a candidacy that initially looked good and now is completely dead in the water, and that is of another scandalized player, Omar Vizquel. Omar Vizquel, like Scott Rowland, is entering his sixth year on the ballot. However, they've completely flip-flopped places. So in 2020, back when these guys were in their third year on the ballot, Vizquel captured 53% of the vote, Rowland just 35%. Fast forward a couple years to when they were in their fifth year on the ballot, Vizquel captured just 24% of the vote, whereas Rowland got all the way up to 63%. The general trend of Hall of Fame balloting is that if a writer votes for you one year, they'll proceed to vote for you in the subsequent years that you continue to appear on the ballot. That's not happening with Omar Vizquel. We've seen many writers retract their votes for him over the last couple of years, and it's because of off-the-field stuff. Here's an article from Sports Illustrated from August 2021. Former MLB shortstop Omar Vizquel is being sued for allegedly sexually harassing a bat boy who has autism while he was a manager of the Birmingham Barons. This is just, I mean, this is just awful stuff. You know, people have had maybe some other opinions about cases in which the character clause was invoked, like, say, that of, you know, Kurt Schilling. This is this is a completely different animal, I would have to say. I think this is something that everyone can agree is, is abhorrent behavior that should not be celebrated at all. And as a result, Omar Vizquel's candidacy is dead in the water. Now, based on the voting trend, the Hall of Fame voters have made it very clear that what Omar Vizquel is accused of having done will not be tolerated at all. But there are more subtle, uh, more nuanced cases in which the character clause has been enforced, and I think one of those is Jeff Kent. Jeff Kent is in his 10th and final year on this Hall of Fame ballot. He was a very good baseball player, one of the greatest offensive second basemen of all time, However, he just happened to have a very prickly personality. That's maybe putting it lightly. He was kicked off his high school team. He got into an enormous dugout fight with Barry Bonds during his time on the Giants. And just generally, wherever Jeff Kent went, he was seen as, you know, a bad teammate, um, someone who, you know, nobody seemed to get along with, maybe a net negative in the locker room. And yet, at the same time, statistically, this is one of the greatest offensive second basemen in the history of the game. Among players who played the majority of their game at the second base position, Jeff Kent has the most home runs. He has 377 career home runs. And I'm sure if you took a look back at every other position, you know, the player with the most home runs in that position is a Hall of Famer or, you know, is scandalized by steroids. And I should say, you know, Jeff Kent, he's like one of those guys that there have always been whispers about. I would put him in the category of Hall of Famers like Pudge Rodriguez and Jeff Bagwell. You know, because of the era they played in, there was plenty of suspicion and yet never really any concrete evidence that they used performance-enhancing drugs. Similar situation with OPS. The only second baseman ahead of him in career OPS are slam dunk, no doubt, Hall of Famers. And look, with Jeff Kent having captured just 33% of the vote in his ninth year last year, he has effectively no chance of reaching the Hall of Fame via the writer's vote. You know, it's possible to make a jump from, you know, 65 to 75. It's not possible to make a jump from 33 to 75. So he's effectively done. However, that said, he could be an interesting candidate on a veterans committee somewhere down the road. We've really hit the big names on this ballot, so now I'd like to talk about some of the interesting dark horse candidacies that are going on. These are players that, you know, may be able to pull 5, 10, 15% of the vote at any given time, but at least from my perspective, 
you can actually make an interesting Hall of Fame case for them. And the first one of those is Mark Burley. I've talked about Mark Burley in an episode of Baseball Bits. He's one of my favorite players ever. He has a lot of intangibles that could make you, you know, into a very well-liked player. He was well-liked as a teammate. He played great defense. He had like an all-time great defensive highlight. He threw a very memorable perfect game. He worked fast. He was known for the hectic pace which he worked on the mound, which, look, in a pitch clock era, you know, his name comes up over and over again. Hey, we need more guys who pitch like Mark Burley. And Mark Burley, to me, represents not necessarily the highest peak, but sort of the ideal of consistency as a pitcher. He was going to go out there, and he was going to give you 200-plus good innings. So, you know, since the divisional era in 1969, here are pitchers with the most seasons of 200 innings pitched, and a 120 ERA+. plus. Mark Burley has eight such seasons, which puts him in line with Roy Halladay, Randy Johnson, Burt Blylevin, you know, just behind Tom Seaver, Jim Palmer, Tom Glavin, Mike Mussina, Justin Verlander. Like, yeah, these guys, you know, surrounding him are all Hall of Famers, and they all had, you know, a level of consistency that Mark Burley also had. He just didn't happen to have the super high peak. Burley managed to just barely stay on the ballot last year, scraping by with 5.8% of the vote. Had he fallen below that 5% threshold, he would have never appeared on a writer's ballot again. Uh, Another player sort of in this category is Bobby Abreu, who in his third year last year finished with 8.6% of the vote. I would expect these players to be safe going forward, especially given that they'll make gains now because the ballot is less crowded than it was in 2022. Year in and year out, Bobby Abreu continues to be maybe the most interesting candidate on this ballot because you could make a statistical case for him to be included in the Hall of Fame. And yet, this is a player who has zero, count him, zero Hall of Fame vibes. There was never any point during Bobby Abreu's career where people were talking about him as a future Hall of Famer. When you say Bobby Abreu, his name out loud, you say, oh yeah, that was a pretty good baseball player. You don't say, huh, should that guy be a Hall of Famer? Zero Hall of Fame vibes. And yet, the case can be made statistically because he is kind of a sabermetric darling. He got on base. He stole bases efficiently. Here's another extremely arbitrary stat head search. This is the 400, 1400, 2400 club. This is 400 stolen bases, 1400 walks, 2400 hits. Another way I would put this is maybe sort of the platonic ideal for a leadoff hitter. Look at Bobby Abreu in the same club as Ricky Henderson, Barry Bonds, Joe Morgan, and Eddie Collins. Look, Abreu's voting trend tells us that he almost certainly won't get in, so we're just having fun at this point, but here are players since integration with at least 10,000 plate appearances and a career on-base percentage over 390. Look at this crew of players. Look at these on-base percentage kings, and right there with them is Bobby Abreu. Again, zero vibes, zero Hall of Fame vibes, and yet you could make an interesting case. I do want to take this point to shout out both Jimmy Rollins and Torrey Hunter. Considering some of the big names that have vacated this ballot going into 2023, I think they have established themselves as mainstays on the ballot. However, for the sake of a ballot breakdown, I don't think they're super relevant because A, I don't think they have, you know, this interesting sabermetric case for the Hall of Fame, and B, their voting trend doesn't indicate to me, you know, a chance of getting into the Hall of Fame on the writer's ballot, you know, even in year 10 of their candidacies, that could change. You know, if Jimmy Rollins goes out and gets, you know, 25% of the vote this year, then yes, he will be very relevant. But for now, just a shout out for these guys, Jimmy Rollins, Torrey Hunter, they'll continue to be on the ballot for years to come. Apart from Carlos Beltran, who quite frankly has nothing to worry about in terms of the 5% threshold staying on the ballot front, like he'll be fine, there is one more newcomer to this year's ballot that I think has a chance to be a mainstay, just like Abreu and Burley and Rollins and Hunter have established themselves to be. That is Francisco Rodriguez, aka K-Ron. This is a player who appeared to be on a Hall of Fame trajectory until his age 35 season. He pitched 25 innings for Detroit and had a 7.82 ERA. Like relievers often do, the flameout was quick, and this is someone who had been uh, extremely consistent up until then through his age 34 season. I do believe 
he would have been considered to be on a Hall of Fame trajectory. And this is not going to be the most analytical take on things, but part of my job is trying to analyze the Hall of Fame voters, and Hall of Fame voters who vote for relievers are going to care about saves. Through their age 34 seasons, Francisco Rodriguez, a.k.a. Kron was the all-time leader in saves. No one had more saves through an age 34 season than him. He had 430 saves through that point. That's way more than Kimbrell, Jansen, Lee Smith, Hoffman, Papelbon. Mariano Rivera, he had 100 more saves than Mariano Rivera through age 34. That That is crazy to think about. And if he had just been able to hold on for a few more years, he would have been way up there on the saves leaderboard. Which is saying a lot because he's fourth. He is fourth all-time in career saves Mariano Rivera, Trevor Hoffman, and Lee Smith are ahead of him. They're all in the Hall of Fame. And if Francisco Rodriguez, again, if he had pushed past that age 34 season, he could have easily been third. He could have maybe even reached second or first. That's, that's the type of pace he was on. Relievers are finicky, and they're a finicky thing to vote for. I think there are people that could make the case that Mariano Rivera is the only reliever that deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I remember last year I was all aboard the Joe Nathan train. I really thought Joe Nathan had this interesting sort of sabermetric case for the Hall. I really wanted him to break that 5% threshold, and he fell just short. I don't feel the same way about Francisco Rodriguez. I don't, I don't feel like I have to like come out now and stump for him and say, hey, you should really consider this guy. You should really vote for this guy because he does have Nathan beat in some of those traditional type stuff that voters will look at, like saves. But either way, it will be fascinating to see whether Francisco Rodriguez can break that 5% barrier and continue to be on this ballot for years to come. So if you look at this 2023 Baseball Hall of Fame ballot, you'll see that some of the players are in italics. And the italics denote that they are a first-year candidate. We've talked about Carlos Beltran. We've talked about Francisco Rodriguez. But there are a lot of other first-year candidates. And the thing about them is, besides Beltran and Rodriguez, I don't think they have a chance to break that 5%. I think they will reach one-and-done designation. However... Being included on the ballot itself is actually a huge honor, and I think we should take some time to celebrate the newcomers who are going to be one and done. Bronson Arroyo. You know, innings are out. If you pitch an inning, that means you got three outs. So volume is important. Between 2005 and 2013, Bronson Arroyo was third in innings in all of Major League Baseball, just behind CC Sabathia and Dan Heron. Just a good, a good innings eater. He was going to give you quality starts. Matt Kane had 30 wins above replacement through his age 27 season, and that's really impressive. If you look at players who did that over the last 30 years, it's a pretty impressive crew. Kershaw, King Felix, Pedro, Sabathia, Chris Sale, Big Z, Carlos Zambrano, and Johan Santana. So Matt Cain was on a very strong pace through his age 27 season, just didn't do too much after that. Way to go, Matt Cain, though. Still a fantastic career. We're talking about World Series. We're talking about perfect game. So Matt Cain, very memorable player. I don't expect him to reach that 5%. R.A. Dickey, definitely one of the greatest stories on this Hall of Fame ballot. Won a Cy Young Award in 2012 at the age of 37 as a knuckleballer. And now you look around the league, knuckleballers are extinct. R.A. Dickey truly was the last of the great knuckleballers. Great story, uh, great person. Not expecting him to get to 5%, but definitely worth celebrating. Jacoby Ellsbury, he had a pretty good start to his career overall, just having to peter out right when he got to New York, but his 2011 season, absolutely legendary stuff. 200 hits, 30-30, 146 OPS plus in center field, led Major League Baseball in total bases, runner-up in MVP, gold glove, silver slugger, all-star. This was a legendary 2011 from Jacoby Ellsbury, definitely the highlight of his career. Andre Ethier, a one-club man, only played in Major League Baseball for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Career, 122 OPS+, plus, 22% better than the league average hitter over that time frame. That's really impressive, a career 122 OPS+. Plus. J.J. Hardy's on the ballot. He played from 2005 to 2017, and during his career, he was one of the best defensive shortstops in the game. By defensive run saved over the course of J.J. Hardy's career, he is fifth, just behind Troy Tulowitzki, Jack Wilson, Brendan Ryan, and Andrelton Simmons, so elite defender at the shortstop position. John Lackey, another classic 
memorable, above average starter who could give you really good volume. Classic gift guy for sure. Some great John Lackey gifts out there. John Lackey in 2007, which was probably the best year of his career, best ERA in the American League and at 224 innings pitched, although he finished third in Cy Young voting that year, like, should he have won? Maybe, maybe he should have won that one. Mike Napoli is on the ballot. He was a catcher earlier in his career who had a bat that was good enough so that he could hang on as a DH later in his career. Among players who played at least 500 career games at catcher, he ranks 11th in career home runs with 267. Johnny Peralta is on the ballot this year. I thought this was pretty cool. Johnny Peralta had multiple seasons of five or more wins above replacement, Almost a decade apart and with different teams, 2005 with Cleveland at the age of 23 and 2014 with St. Louis at the age of 32. So Johnny Peralta, really excellent career. I don't want to diminish these guys. They accomplished a lot, but they just aren't going to be that relevant in terms of the Hall of Fame voting. Houston Street on the ballot, one of the all-time great baseball names, I must say. At the age of 21, he won the Rookie of the Year in the American League for the Oakland Athletics. Had a career 141 ERA plus. That is very impressive. Jared Weaver's on the ballot this year. We're talking about an imposing six foot seven right-handed pitcher who happened to throw 84 miles per hour at the end of his career. People loved that. People loved Jared Weaver and his slow 84 mile per hour fastball. I should also point out that he led the American League in wins while throwing 87. Jason Wirth is the final newcomer on this list. He had not the greatest first act of his career. He had trouble getting established, but then really caught on with the Philadelphia Phillies. After that, though, he joined the Washington Nationals. And a big part of the Jason Wirth narrative is that this was a player that the Washington Nationals went out and spent big money on. He was part of a culture change for the Washington Nationals right around the time they were starting to get competitive and they were getting debuts from Harper and Strasburg. Like Jason Wirth was a big piece of that. 2013 had a huge season for them, by the way, 153 OPS plus, and he made $136 million. That's a lot of money for Jason Wirth. All right, so we made it. It is time for me to fill out my mock Hall of Fame ballot, and the keyword here is mock. You know, even though I'm the most handsome baseball YouTuber there is, I'm not a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, and I don't vote for the Hall of Fame. So this is a mock ballot. This does not count. But here's what I would do if I got the ballot in the mail. I'm going to go alphabetically here. So I'm going to start with Bobby Abreu. And look, this is not a case where I'm saying, oh my gosh, you baseball writers are so stupid if you don't see that Bobby Abreu is a Hall of Famer. It's not that. This is what I would call strategic voting. Just want to make sure he hangs around. I think he has an interesting Hall of Fame case. So yes, first vote alphabetically goes to Bobby Abreu. My next vote is going to go to Carlos Beltran. I really like his statistical profile. I think he was a Hall of Famer before he put on a Houston Astros jersey just to do some ring chasing there at the end. As far as the sign-stealing scandal goes, I think you know he's going to succeed ultimately on this ballot. I think he's going to get a good chunk of voters this year, although maybe not get in, but he will eventually get in via the writer's ballot. And when he does, that'll sort of be the green light for Altuve, and Correa and maybe Bregman down the line, they'll say, hey, we can evaluate these guys based on their stats and accomplishments without this cheating scandal hanging over their heads too much. My next vote is going to go to Mark Burley. I love Mark Burley personally. I would put him in a similar category to Bobby Abreu where I'm not saying, oh my gosh, if someone fills out a ballot and they don't check Mark Burley's name, oh, I'm just going to lose my mind. It's not like that at all. I just have a really just sort of personal admiration for Mark Burley. I think the pitch clock that's going to be instituted in 2023 is going to change Major League Baseball for the better. It's going to be better for the fan experience, and I want to celebrate Mark Burley because he pitched like his entire uniform was on fire. My next vote goes to Mr. Todd Helton. I was, of course, at the forefront of pushing for Larry Walker, and that was just such a huge relief to me when Larry Walker got into the Hall of Fame despite, you know, all the Coors naysayers. As far as Todd Helton's case go, I'm, I consider myself to be more of a recent convert. I'm not going to be, you know, just like hammering it as hard, like, oh my gosh, we have to vote for Todd Helton, guys. However, at the end of the day, I do think statistically he is deserving of being a Hall of Famer. And as far as his voting trajectory goes, I expect him to get in in the next few years. My next vote is going to go to Andrew Jones, the brave center fielder of my childhood. I think if at the age of 30, if Andrew Jones had suffered some sort of 
disastrous career ending injury or he had to retire early because of like a degenerative eye condition he would be in the hall of fame by now there'd be a lot of sympathy for him instead what happened is he got paid he got fat and he seemed to stop caring but if you look at the production in those first 10 years it definitely makes up for it this is a hall of fame caliber player in my eyes will he get in in the long term it's going to be tight at the end, I think. I think he's got a potential for like a year 9 or year 10 induction. My next vote is going to go to Jeff Kent. This is an ad for me. I've not voted for Jeff Kent in the past, so this is a first time for me voting for Jeff Kent. This is also his final year on the ballot. And I guess what I'm saying with this is, hey, Jeff Kent, in the past... The ballot has been a little bit more crowded. I've always considered you, you know, as a possibility. And now I'm just here to say, Jeff Kent, if you got into the Hall of Fame in 2023, I would be fine. But it won't be happening, at least not via the writer's ballot. My next vote is going to be Aaron, Alex Rodriguez. This is a case where I am using a rule that I didn't exactly make up, but I have talked about. And it's the idea of the steroid tax. And it's saying, hey... Yes, Alex Rodriguez, you cheated, you used steroids, liar, liar, pants on fire. However, if we institute a steroid tax which says, hey, if we remove 20 or 30% of your production and you're still a Hall of Famer, then maybe we can put you in. So, you know, I'm fine with putting in, you know, Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens because these were truly just generational players. You know, I don't feel the same way about maybe Manny Ramirez or Gary Sheffield. These were excellent players. These were two of the best, you know, right-handed sluggers the game had ever seen, but they wouldn't be up for consideration to be, say, you know, top 10 or top 20 players all time or inner circle Hall of Famers. That belongs to A-Rod. A-Rod gets my vote. My vote goes to Scott Rowland, Hall of Fame voter. If you are watching this, if you have made it this far in the video, just go out there, just go vote for Scott Rowland. I don't even really care what else you do. Just go vote for Scott Rowland. This is a player who is completely unscandalized and completely deserving, who has been overlooked because of some of the more salacious names like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and Kurt Schilling who have appeared in past ballots. This is his year. This is his time to shine. Go vote for Scott Rowland. And given that I can only vote for 10 players, my 10th and final vote goes to Billy Wagner. Absolutely dominant, dominant, dominant. Now I want to make some predictions for a few key players on this ballot. The first is Carlos Beltran. I think Carlos Beltran overall is going to do very well. I don't think he's going to necessarily reach that 75% threshold that would require him to be a first ballot Hall of Famer but I do think he will set himself up to get in fairly shortly, so in the next few years. So I think Carlos Beltran does well. Jeff Kent is in his 10th and final year on the ballot, and I'm not going out on a limb here, but he's not going to make it, guys. Just looking at his voting trend, he's not going to be in the Hall of Fame via the writer's ballot. He may be an interesting case for a veterans committee to look at down the line, but Jeff Kent is going to fall off and uh, that is despite my fake mock ballot checkmark for him. K-Rod, Francisco Rodriguez in a similar position to Joe Nathan last year. I actually think he's going to stay on the ballot by reaching that 5% threshold. It's because the ballot is a little bit more clear than last year's thanks to the exits of Sosa, Schilling, Bonds, Clemens. This is a good opportunity for Francisco Rodriguez, what many would see as a fairly weak Hall of Fame ballot, to get some recognition, get to the 5% threshold. That is my prediction for K-Rod. And then finally, it helps to keep in mind that the Baseball Writers Association of America likes to induct at least one person every year. And my guess is that this year it is going to be Scott Rowland. He got up to 63% last year, so it's going to take another big jump. But I think that big jump will be aided by the fact that the ballot has cleared out a lot of space for him. So I think Scott Rowland this year, 2023, Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame voters have no obligation to reveal their ballots to the public, and yet, every year, some of them do. So it's time for my annual shout-out of the Baseball Hall of Fame Vote Tracker, which you can find at bbhoftracker.com. These are people that keep track of the publicly revealed ballots, and once you get up to, you know, 100 or 200 of them, you can start to have a decent idea of where a candidacy is going. This is an early look at the tracker. There have only been three public ballots revealed, so it's too small of a sample size to draw any sort of meaningful conclusion from. But over the next month or so leading up to the results, there will be many more votes added to the Baseball Hall of Fame ballot tracker. 
Uh, you can see the tracker team is headed by Mr. Tibbs himself, Ryan Thibodeau. Go follow all these guys if you really want to take a peek at the Hall of Fame voting process and see votes as they roll in and as they are revealed by various members of the Baseball Writers Association of America. Now normally this would be the end of the video, but we're not even close to done because there is another Veterans Committee vote this year and it is an absolute doozy. Hey, if you thought those baseball writers with their private, not publicly revealed ballots were secretive, how about 16 baseball elites coming together during the winter meetings in just a few days to decide the fates of some of the biggest names in MLB history, some potentially watershed moments for these big steroid guys who just fell off the ballot. We're talking Bonds, we're talking Clements, we're also talking guys like Kurt Schilling who also fell off the ballot. This is it. This is the committee vote. So the fascinating thing about this year's Veterans Committee vote is that right off the bat, just one year after they fall off the ballot, we have Bonds and Clemens once again eligible for induction to the Hall of Fame. And if you're one of those people who thought, well, these last 10 years have grown so tiresome, all this discourse, I'm so glad they went off the ballot and now we can talk more about Scott Rowland and Andrew Jones. Well, not so fast, my friend, because Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, thanks to the Veterans Committee, are back up for consideration. And maybe it's a good thing, right? Maybe the writers weren't qualified to make this call about these historically great players who also happen to use steroids. Maybe they should have been more decided by a committee of their own peers, and that's what this is. This is more representative of the baseball playing population versus the baseball writing population. And yet the most interesting inclusion on this Veterans Committee ballot might not be Bonds or Clemens, it might be Kurt Schilling. So the deal with Kurt Schilling was that he has always had sort of an antagonistic relationship with both sports media and also the political media world. And leading into his 10th year on the ballot, he asked to be removed. He didn't want to be voted on by these baseball writers anymore. Uh, as a result, he was not removed, but he was dropped from a lot of ballots. He fell short of that 75% threshold needed for induction. However, now he's ultimately going to get what he wants. And what he wanted was a committee-type vote, which he felt like would be more representative of his peers, maybe some of his friends in the baseball playing world, than his enemies in the baseball writing world. So this is an interesting gambit for Kurt Schilling. And I would say there's a good chance that it all pays off for him in the end. And so in a world of the Bonds and the Clemens and the Schilling, you know, who is the Scott Rowland of this Veterans Committee vote? Who is the unproblematic, you know, statistically deserving Hall of Famer on this ballot? I think it is Fred McGriff. Fred McGriff, we talked about him in the Todd Helm comparison. Just a great player, a well-liked player, and an interesting foil to the likes of Bonds, Clemens, and Schilling. I don't think there are any especially egregious inclusions on this committee ballot. You know, maybe someone like Albert Bell could be compared to Dick Allen, who is someone who I think should be in the Hall of Fame personally. But uh, all these guys have statistical cases that could be made. Even someone like Don Mattingly, who I think statistically is one of the weaker inclusions. He has a lot of supporters in the public world. There are a lot of baseball fans who think Don Mattingly should be a Hall of Famer. And with him, you know, leaving the Marlins as a manager and, you know, that potentially the end of his career in professional baseball as both a player and manager, he may receive special consideration this year. Also on this 2023 contemporary baseball era ballot is Dale Murphy, who has been kind of a fixture on these committee type votes lately. He appeared in 2018, didn't get in. He appeared in 2020, didn't get in. And it's interesting because, you know, they can tell you no a bunch of times, but if they tell you yes just once, you go into Cooperstown. That's what happened to Gil Hodges. Gil Hodges had many years on the writer's ballot, didn't get in. Many years of committee votes didn't get in. And, and then just last year was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Maybe the same fate awaits Dale Murphy. Maybe this is his year. He's an interesting use case for the character clause going the other way. You know, the character clause has been used to penalize PED users like Bonds and Clemens, but you don't see it used to promote players who are generally seen as, you know, virtuous or good teammates or just individuals of high moral standing, and, and that's Dale Murphy for sure. The final player on the 2023 contemporary baseball era ballot is Rafael Palmero, who is, with all due respect, a completely pointless inclusion. Look, he has the stats, obviously, 3,000 hits, 500 home runs, but really Bonds and Clemens should be 
the only steroid guys on here. They are the representatives of that era. They are the absolute top tier players of that era. And really, they should just let the committee vote on Bonds and Clemens, decide their fate before we can even start to talk about some of these guys like Rafael Palmero or Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa or, you know, who else have you. But so Rafael Palmero, he is on here. I would say just a completely pointless inclusion, though. I would much rather see someone like Kenny Lofton included. I think Kenny Lofton should absolutely be a Hall of Famer. Rafael Palmero, he has the stats, but in the context of the steroid year, in the context of Bonds and Clemens also being on here, pointless. Here are the recently announced members of the 16-person Hall of Fame board appointed electorate charged with the review of the contemporary baseball era ballot. These are the players and the executives and the media members that are going to vote on these aforementioned players. And they have a chance to really make a mark on baseball history. They could answer the steroid question, you know, should Barry Bonds be in the Hall of Fame? Should Roger Clemens be in the Hall of Fame? And I can't help but wonder if it's a good thing or a bad thing that those guys are immediately on this ballot following, you know, dropping off the writer's ballot. Maybe we need a little more distance. Maybe we need a little more time. Or maybe it's a great thing and we can decide once and for all here and now. It seems almost impossible to make a prediction here, but given some of the names, you can at least start to get an inkling about how some of them might vote. Susan Slusser is on here. I think she's a phenomenal inclusion on this Veterans Committee. You know, just a phenomenal beat writer in the Bay Area for decades now. And, you know, I would predict her to probably vote for Barry Bonds, and because Susan Slusser's great, and because she's an ideologically consistent person, I imagine she may also vote for Roger Clemens. But then you take a look at some of these players, you say, hey, there's Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas, you know, an anti-PED guy, maybe he won't vote for Bonds or Clemens. And then you look at, hey, wait, Chipper Jones and Greg Maddox are both on here? Like, aren't they clearly going to vote for their teammate, Fred McGriff? So you can, you can start to get a little bit of an inkling, although it's very hard to make any sort of concrete prediction. But that's definitely not going to stop me from making a prediction, and obviously any prediction is going to revolve around Bonds and Clemens, so I think I'll just come out and say, I don't think this is the year for them. I don't think 2023 is the year for Bonds and Clemens. I think we're going to continue to have more questions and more discussions in years to come over these guys. I could be dead wrong, and the reason I could be wrong is because there's so many players voting on this, so many players who overlap careers with Bonds and Clemens, and they may have a different perspective on the steroid era than the baseball writers. You know, they were in those locker rooms. They know the pervasiveness of the PED usage of that time, and if, if their perspective is, hey, if the, you know, the majority of players were also doing these things, then maybe Bonds and Clemens deserve it. That could be the perspective, but I'm going to say my prediction is a no for Bonds and a no for Clemens, although I will say the most hilarious outcome would be if one of them gets in, but the other doesn't. So who is going to get in? And I think Kurt Schilling is going to get into the Hall of Fame in 2023 via this contemporary baseball era ballot. And in doing so, he will get exactly what he wanted. You know, Kurt Schilling wanted to be removed from the writer's ballot. That happened. His 10 years ran out. He expired. And now he gets to be voted on by what he believes to be a committee of his own peers. And that includes players, and those are his own peers. It also includes, you know, front office types and media types and historians. But but he this is who he wanted to induct him into the Hall of Fame, not the baseball writers who he has like a very adversarial relationship with. He wants, you know, players that he played alongside. And I ultimately think this gambit will work. I think Kurt Schilling is going to get in. If I had to make, you know, a more kind of interesting sort of like political type analysis of it, I would say many baseball players are right wing or conservative. They might not be as vocal about it as Kurt Schilling is, but they won't be as turned off by some of his rhetoric as some of the baseball writer types have been in the ballot over the last 10 years or so. But there will also be a balancing effect to it because if Kurt Schilling represents someone you know, who doesn't have the strongest of moral fibers, someone who scammed the entire state of Rhode Island, then I also think Fred McGriff has a very strong chance to get in here as Kurt Schilling's foil, just a generally well-liked, underappreciated ball player in his time, 493 career home runs. If you include his playoff total, he is over that 500 mark, which used to mean automatic induction unscandalized, really well-liked. You look at Maddox, you look at Chipper Jones on that committee. I think this is the year for Fred McGriff. 
So that means if I'm totally 100% right, which I always am totally 100% right, there will be three new members of the Hall of Fame class for 2023. Those three will be Scott Rowland, Kurt Schilling, and Fred McGriff. Thank you so much for watching, and I'm very sorry for caring about the Hall of Fame.